My name is Lindy Wemajele Sibanda. I am the chair of the CGIAR system board. I'm a farmer in Zimbabwe. I'm a mother of three adults and I am a scientist. What excites me most about my work is when I work with farmers and when I'm at my farm. Just planting seeds, seeing them grow, getting babies from my cattle, my goats, and just being in open air where you're in touch with nature. But most important, using modern technologies to improve farming and to make sure we safeguard the environment. That makes me happy. To me, leadership is all about seven leadership. Don't deploy work that you yourself cannot do. And the people who really inspire me are Gracia Michelle and Mama Mama uh, Mary Robinson. They are simple, they are hardworking, they can connect at all levels, but most important, they give it to other women. They love mentoring girls and other women. Some of the major obstacles that I face as a woman, as a farmer, as an African, are the biases that are associated with the three things. Women need to be helped, they are disadvantaged. Farmers are poor, particularly coming from Africa. And mothers need to spend more time at home and not be globetrotting to meetings. So, as upcoming women, make sure that you show you can strive and excel in all environments. It's not about either or, it's we can do it, regardless of the circumstances. Women are natural agents of change, and all they need is a conducive environment. As women, we should be spending more time with other women, making sure we share our stories, our successes, and our struggles. The whole idea is to convince each other it can be done and that we are the best agents of change. So let's document the stories, let's take them to other women. That way we can achieve more impact and overcome the stereotype that we can't. Please join our next seminar in the Catalyst of Change series on August 29th. Welcome to the Catalyst of Change Women Leaders in Science Seminar Series. There is interpretation available in Spanish, French, and Hindi. To access the interpretation, you choose the language of your preference by clicking the translation button at the base of your Zoom screen. Today, we will be hearing from an extraordinary professor in the, at the University of Pretoria in South Africa and senior leader, leader and policy advisor to global institutions, Professor Lindy Wesibana. Following Professor Sibanda's presentation, she will have a conversation with Ana Luisa Garcia Oliveira, who works as Semi Regional Genotyping Coordinator in Nairobi, Kenya. We invite you to follow us in LinkedIn, YouTube, and social media using the hashtag Women in Science for the Catalyst of Change Women Leaders in Science Seminar Series. On the screen, you will see the QR code that will give you access to Slido for submitting questions and comments to be addressed by the speaker at the end of her, pre of her presentation in the Q&I in the Q&A session. Now, I would like to welcome Brian Goberts, Director General of CIMIT, to officially open the event and welcome our speaker, Lindy Wesibanda. Dr. Goberts, the floor is yours. Thank you, Isabel, and a good day, good afternoon, good evening, everyone on Zoom, YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn, wherever and from wherever you are tuning in to, to yet another, our fourth now, webinar of our Catalyst of Change Women Leaders in Science series. At Summit, we're hosting this uh, TED Talk meets fireside chat style series on women leaders because we want more women leaders in our science institution. To achieve this goal of broader representation and gender balance and, balance and inclusion in science, we need to provide more opportunities to hear from different voices, different leadership styles, different examples, different heroes, their lives, journeys, lessons, and insights. In this series, we highlight women who are leaders in all sorts of capacities, at home, in the field, in their village, in their community, in, uh, in the world, in the globe. 
because we believe that leadership styles can take many different forms. Today, we have an exceptional leader for you, Linue Sibanda, member of Simit's board for the second time now and chair of the CJR system board. She is a true catalyst of change and she's our guest speaker today. Linue is an animal scientist and a practicing farmer with extensive experience, serving as a policy advisor to numerous African governments and global institutions. Linue serves on the Nestle board and as chair of the council at the National University of Science and Technology in Zimbabwe and as extraordinary professor at the University of Pretoria, South Africa. She's an associate fellow at Chatham House and a member of Champions 12.3, accelerating progress on the UN Sustainable Development Goal target, halving, half, halving global per capita food waste. She's one of the few that can say she has cooked with uh, Bill Gates himself, one of the few that actually can say that she's almost a daughter uh, of Borlock and for sure a hunger fighter in its true right, part of the global army. She's one of an example for me personally. She's an example for the Simit family. She is what take it to the farmer means. She is farmers first. Landyway, Lindyway, thank you for honoring us with your presence here today. And thank you to everybody who's joining us online. Let's get this started. Linda, you know, you're still in mute, I believe, so if you can. So thank you very much, Bram, for that uh, kind introduction. I've been asked to talk about my life and uh, it's a very dangerous start because once you talk about life that has been lived for over five decades and soon to be six, you cannot stop. But allow me to unpack my life in uh, just 20 minutes over five key line items. I would like to talk about my life as a scholar, my life as a mother, my life as a working professional, my life as a governor, and then my life getting close to a closing chapter of giving back. Let me start with my life as a scholar. I'm one of the few privileged who went to a public school, who went to a private school, and then went to a public university. I grew up in Zimbabwe in the 60s. And at that time, Zimbabwe was called Rhodesia. So we were living under apartheid. What that meant was that Blacks had their own segregated schools. You could not go to school with white people. We accepted it. We stayed in our lane. But one thing that's unique about Zimbabwean education is that it was the best of the best, that we excelled in whatever was given to us. I was lucky after primary school that my mother saw the opportunity to move me to what was then called an exclusive private school, a white dominated school, where suddenly I became the minority with only three black uh, uh, students in a class, which was a kept limit, I believe, because of the policy of apartheid at that time. I learned new skills. I learned how to cope in a multiracial environment. I learned how to understand how the majority within that class think of the minority, that's the three blacks. And yet in my after school life, I lived in a majority world of black people. One thing that I took away from that experience was that creating friendships helps you overcome racial barriers helps you overcome segregation because through friendships and the friends I created, we could talk about these difficult topics. My friends would ask me, How, why are your people always speaking loud? And I would also ask them, why do you live with just six people in a house where in my household, there's 12 of us with my cousins, with my aunts, and there's always enough food for everybody. So 
breaking barriers was about creating friends and it's friends I have kept up to now. So for me, cutting across cultural barriers, cutting across racial barriers became something that I picked up in my early teens as from the age of 13. This also prepared me for my tertiary education where I went to Egypt, where once again, I was the only one from Zimbabwe. Life was tough. We lived in a hostel of about 300 girls. And because the rooms were limited, we had to share beds, we had to sleep on the floor, something that never used to happen at the University of Zimbabwe. But because I had the staying power to say whatever circumstances are presented, you just have to make the most of it. I sailed through and I was one of the first Africans to graduate with a first class honors out of the University of Alexandria. I also chose a unique field. I was privileged to study there on a government scholarship. And these were scholarships that were given to the government of Zimbabwe after attaining independence. So I went there to study agriculture. There were 13 choices. I opted for animal science because I believed if I understood how to improve productivity of our traditional matabele goats, I would come back home and make sure rather than one piece of meat per meal that my grandmother used to serve, I would be able to have a large steak every night. Well, it has turned out to be the reverse now that I understand better about nutrition and about healthy living. But that was my incentive for studying agriculture and no regrets up to now. I then went on to be a mother. I'm one of the lucky few who got married and had children after I had attained my PhD and I was in my thirties. I say lucky because most of my colleagues were doubling up at school, college and starting up a family. But even then having a family whilst working was not the easiest of things. The big lessons I took from that was being organized because I had my first child, three of them came within five years. My first child I had when I was a university professor. My second child, I was working for an international organization as a regional policy advisor. And my third child, Likwa, came when I was running my own business, Linz Agricultural Services. In all three jobs, there was a lot of travel. But I'm proud to say as a mother, I was able to breastfeed all three of my children for the full 12 months of their first year. That took a lot of planning, expressing breast milk so that they could enjoy breast is best as we say, but making sure I show up at all the international commitments. And it is during that time that I started not working locally, but regionally and internationally. The travel didn't stop me from making sure I call in at home and check on the children. And thanks to our African culture, my grandmother, my auntie and the helpers were always there to look after the children and including my husband who was also traveling but spent more time at home, a little bit more than me. So multitasking, being organized were the key um, issues that you don't go to school to learn but they were the coping mechanisms that made me survive that era of motherhood. I'm happy to say all three of the children are now 30, 27 and 26 full adults and I want to believe responsible professionals. The third phase I want to talk about is really my professional life. As I say, I've worked as an university professor, I've worked as a regional policy advisor for food security, I've worked as a business owner in my own enterprise that I established now 27 years old, Leeds Agricultural Services, and also worked as a regional policy advisor for FANAPAN, where I was the chief executive officer um, working through 19 countries. What I can say about those four or five chapters of my life is that really being a professional, being a woman professional takes honesty, takes integrity, but more important networks. And you may want to know why I left those jobs. At the university, I worked for about four years. 
And then I moved out to join a private company where I learned how to do consultants work and advisory work in agriculture. After two years in that private firm, I said, I can do this. I actually went for training on how to be an entrepreneur. And after that training, I came back and resigned and started my own firm, which I ran for 12 years as the managing director. I stepped down when I was invited to work as a regional advisor in policy, something I never went to school for, but because I'm a continuous learner, I was able to pick up the skills right from my consulting work and just reading a lot about who needs advice, how do you package advice, and what's the source of knowledge that equips policymakers. So I know I always laugh half the time when I'm confused for an economist and I say, who says economists in agriculture are the only advisors? You can learn to be an advisor once you understand the problem and you know where to get the solutions and you can package that knowledge in a way that people can use. And also remember that you provide them with options and you are not the only advisor to those governments or those institutions. When I moved to FANPAN, I stayed at FANPAN the longest, about 12 years. I suppose that is very long for one organization. But to be honest, it was my job as a CEO to grow the network, which I grew from eight countries to 19 years over those 12 years, and grew the network, which was a network policy analysis network, which brought in governments, private sector, researchers, and farmers into making sure Africa is food and nutrition secure. I enjoyed the time at Fanpan, but also it helped me sharpen my skills as a CEO. But more important, why I couldn't leave despite the many offers I got to go from regional to international was that it kept me close to my children. This was a delicate stage for my children that were now teenagers going through high school. And I felt I needed to have them around me. So despite all the offers, I would go for interviews and say, oh, that was good exercise, but not for now. And I must say, I only left Fanpan only when my last born son, Likwa, was now moving to college overseas and I was comfortable that they could be their own persons and get on with life. Key lesson there is really know your priorities. You can get all the offers, best jobs, double the pay, more opportunities, dream jobs, but I think I wanted to be a good mother first and foremost, and I wanted to be there for my children at a critical stage. And I suppose those are the choices mothers have to make. And I believe I was lucky to have had the opportunity to make those choices, practice them and come out good. Now to my next chapter, chapter four, I've covered my scholarship years, I've covered my motherhood years, I've covered my professional years. And next I go to my governance. I believe I've been lucky in life in that um, I started being appointed as a governor at national level, at regional level and at international level some 15 years ago. The first Governance meetings were daunting because I had not been trained, but it's people who like you, they like your demeanor, they like your commitment to the work contract, and they also like you as a person with integrity. But I think what kept me going in that first governance appointment was the learning spirit that I harbor. Always I looked around the room I chose my mentors. I never went up to say you're my mentor, but it will be something I like about their values, something I like about the way they ask questions, something I like about just their demeanor and how they engage with others. And I started learning. And over the years, my circle of friends and teachers and mentors have grown. And I have served in over 12 boards and I feel this is space that I enjoy. What I enjoy about being in boards is that I eventually went for training on how to be a governor, but it's the learning spirit amongst the board members. You learn about the organizations you serve. You also give back a lot. You also become someone 
whose values are put out on the table because whenever you have to make a point, whenever you have a point of departure from your colleagues, I find in most times it's that quiet voice in me that says, is this the right thing to do? Is this something I can live with? Or is it something I should stick my neck out for and say it shouldn't be done? It's about intuition, but also my faith. I, I am a, a strong person with strong beliefs in my faith. And I feel that has been my rudder in terms of holding me true to my principles. And the network I've built around me of trusted friends who I go to whenever I'm in doubt and I have this quiet voice that is nagging me. I don't feel shy to pick up a call, engage with friends whom I consult with and they position me right aligned to my values. My final chapter, the fifth one is the chapter I'm at now. I'm struggling between governance work. I don't have a full-time day job. I do my farming. I do my governance work. I currently serve in the CJR. I also serve at a national university as a governor. I serve with the University of Pretoria as an extraordinary professor and more of just networking, mentorship. But where I'm really moving to and the space I'm also enjoying between governance and giving back. Giving back is fun space. I will be 60 in a few weeks time. And really this is the stage where I want to spend more time writing about my life, but investing in people because I feel within my family, and when I say family, it's not my three children, I have hundreds of nephews, nieces, cousins who are all following their own paths, but they all come back to me and uh, they learn one or two things. When I'm at the farm, they join me when I'm in my household. And my son just reminded me that no one has ever told you that when your family, extended family visit you. They have to wash dishes. They have to cook. You have to teach them a few traditional things. They have to know about the work you do. And that's what I'm enjoying. But besides my immediate family, I've expanded this to networks where I interact with young talent and I try and bring them into my space, be it employing them where I have the opportunity within my farm and other businesses that I run, but also in places where I've influenced, connecting them to opportunities, but also doing just one-on-one -on -one mentorship. I find there are lots of people who just call up and say, can I pick your brains on this? But more important, I'm still learning. I think it's that spirit of continuous thirst for knowledge, for new information that has kept me going. And it's all about integrity. What people see in me is what they get. I've never had to be fake. What I know, I know and make sure I know very well. What I don't know, I'm not shy to say I don't know. So those are the five chapters in my life as a scholar, a mother, a professional, a governor, and the life of giving back, which I'm enjoying now. That's it. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you, Lindy Wei. So we are now uh, going to give the floor to Anna in order to have your excellent Irish chat right now. Thank you. Thank you, Renata. Very grateful for this opportunity. It's really a privilege. Uh, my name is Anna Oliveira, and I'm a member of the Women in Crop Science at CIMIT. And the interest in conducting this interview with Dr. Lindiwe stemmed from the remarkable career and notable accomplishments that she has. We are particularly interested in her willingness to share valuable advice with both the present and upcoming generations of women scientists. Uh, Dr. Lindiwe, thank you very much. It's really a privilege. And the first question is, the changes you have seen that are remarkable and your role in it. Kindly, could you give an example? All right, the changes I have seen. Um, as I described my scholarly life, one of the things that's been exciting for me is to see this issue of inclusion and diversity being unpacked. As I say, 
we always have the minority and the majority. And the majority are in a privileged position because they can cushion each other. Whenever you are in a situation where you are the minority, you don't have anyone to look around to. But what I've enjoyed seeing is more women coming into leadership positions, more women getting into boards and being governors, and more women having influence. And for me, it's something that was theoretical. It's something in inclusion was something and diversity was something that was window dressing. You know, you, you picked one or two so that you look right. As I said in my primary education during the apartheid era, I had that privilege of being in a minority school and I know what it feels like. But when we now can talk about it of how do you feel as the excluded when you finally become included, it is now a common narrative and it is something that the world is going out to address. The world is going out to address that it's a good thing to have women in leadership. It's a good thing to have women leaders. It's a good thing to have boards of governors, including women at 50-50 minimum and even more, because we are different and we bring diverse skills, all of which are needed. So for me, that's what has been exciting and to live in an era where a problem has found a solution. So inclusion, diversity is something that I've witnessed and I'm proud to say we are on the right track. Thank you. Thank you very much. The second question is, could you identify elements to remember to be a catalyst of change? Could you explain some examples from your own experience? I can repeat if needs. So where have I been a catalyst of change? I think when you are thinking about being a catalyst, you have to remove the self out. It means you are not the champion, but you are the activator, you are the helper, you are the person who checks out the list and says, are we doing this right? Who else do we need to get us to be effective? I want to believe that um, catalyst of change, let me start with my life as a farmer. Farming is a humbling profession. You, you really get it 100% right. So by being a woman farmer, a commercial farmer, an educated farmer, I believe I've been a catalyst of change because I have heard other farmers say, oh, I wish I was educated too. Why? Because African farming has been stereotyped as a poor person's job. But when you step into it with education and you are a woman, and you own the farm, I think you are a catalyst of bigger change because when others see you doing it, they then see it can be done, particularly those that have been left behind uh, women. Another area where I've been a catalyst of change is in my professional academic life. I grew up in a family where I was privileged. My fa father only had three years of education but he's a big mentor for not just his, his city, Bulawayo, but Zimbabwe-wide, he's known for helping others. And one thing that he instilled in all of us in our family is that girls should be more educated than boys because they are the bedrock of the family. Now, I remember when I graduated from my first degree in Egypt, I was so sure I'd come back and catch up with my friends who had gone off after high school and got in fancy jobs, company car, company house. And my, my mother came to the graduation in Egypt with a little letter from my father to say, it would be good if you stay at school and do your master's. So I continued and stayed. Then after my master's, my father came to the graduation and that was in England at the University of Reading. He said to me, oh, that was very good. I saw you were wearing a black gown. How come there was, another lot but few who were wearing red gowns what have they studied i said no 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 those are doctors they are phds he said that's the gown i want you to wear so i stayed at school again and had to get my phd i finished my phd came back accomplished one of few in the village 
woman with a PhD. And of course, it becomes a go-to reference. Why can't you become like the Spanda children and get a PhD? But my dad didn't stop there. My husband was a university professor. And so my dad said, how come Lindela is called a professor and you're a doctor and both of you have PhDs? I said, dad, he's been writing publications. He says, but how come you've been showing me papers? Can't you write more papers and become professor? So when I retired from my day job at Agra, I devoted time at the University of Pretoria, packaged all my, my papers, and I was then appointed professor there. That has made my dad happy. But to my colleagues as an influencer, I have become a go-to reference to colleagues in the village, to colleagues in the country that it can be done. So I believe it's being a catalyst by showing it can be done and not just being prescriptive. So those are two examples that uh, I can give, but I can go on about being a mother, struggling motherhood, professional life, traveling, and making sure you give it your best, whatever you've set out to do. I think that's been my hallmark. Whether it's a sweeping job, I make sure it's done better than the best sweeper. And I think it's about giving your best. You then become a catalyst of change because others look at you as an example and say it can be done. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think it's really very important when we say that the support is very important. The third and last question that we have is, could you share with us a key phrase that women leaders in science can easily remember? <laughs> ah. I, I love story taking. I, I, I love uh, telling stories. So key phrase, a phrase should be short, right? It's a billboard. Uh, but maybe just to preface that by saying that um, what becomes memorable is what you practice. And I think for me, never be afraid to be a pioneer. Never be afraid to raise the bar. Whenever I give a talk, I look back and say, oops, I could have done this better because I always raise my own bar. I don't wait for comments. And then I live a life of purpose. What I don't like, I don't take. What I like, I take it and do it beyond expectation. So maybe the phrase, if you were to look at those three Ps that I've mentioned, it's pioneering progress with purpose. Always be a pioneer, always progress. Don't be satisfied with where you have arrived. There is no final station in life until you reach your grave. And third, always live a life of purpose. So pioneering progress with purpose would be my key phrase. Thank you. Thank you really very much. It is really a pleasure and I'm very grateful for this opportunity. Isabel, please kindly, we can proceed for the for other questions. But maybe Anna, before we go to other questions, what about your life? I'm keen to hear your takeaway from this presentation. <laughs> I have a lot of takeaways because I have the screen here and uh, I have the camera here. So I took a lot of notes and definitely <laughs> because I, I like to write and I like to, to memorize some of the keywords. And definitely one of them is the, the support, support from others. Are, it, it's extremely uh, important. And sometimes even if we don't share how much thankful we are, we are. Um, also the pioneer and the humility. I think something that uh, we talked today in our, in our fast uh, talk, um, I think humility is very, very important. And in Africa, yeah. particularly yeah. due to the diversity, it's extremely important that we are humble. Yeah. And from my own perspective, because I already stay in many countries in different cultures, I think uh, kindness and um, be humble, it's always a, a key to, to proceed. But you got I it. Stories, and I love to listen some stories. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much.
We appreciate uh, Professor Sivanda and Ana Luisa Garcia Oliveira for this very interesting conversation. We are very grateful for this stimulating conversation and contributions. Now, we would like to open the floor for questions from the audience. We invite you to raise your hand to turn on your camera and unmute. If you would like to ask a question or you can submit it uh, through a uh, slide. So we have already received some few uh, questions. Um, I'm going to read the first one. Um, you came from um, Upper Thay. You have seen the transformation. How did you go beyond the anger of the exclusion you were subject to during that time? So, yep, thank you very much for that question. I think we need to unbungle this anger. Unfortunately, we get angry because of ignorance. Don't forget that the oppressor is oppressing you because they think that's the right thing to do. They've inherited it, it's the status quo. The oppressed is inheriting anger that we have to fight the oppressor because they've oppressed us, they oppressed our grandfathers and our fathers. But as I said, by creating friendships across the barrier, you learn to understand that the bottom line is we are all human beings and there's a big element of ignorance. It's about perpetuation of what you know and what you know, if it's siloed and not opened up, you will continue the status quo of being an oppressor. But once you discover that Lindiwe is black, Lindiwe is happy, Lindiwe lives in a family of 10, they have three meals a day and they have a culture that guides them. And then we are all humans with the same aspirations. You start breaking the barriers and then you forget about the color after a while you don't see it. So I personally never had the anger because I discovered through the friends I, I made when I was still young, that poor souls, they are ignorant. They need to be educated. And it then became my life journey. When I see a racist, I say, poor soul, they need to be educated about how fun it is to be of a different culture. And that I'm in my happy space. I'm not aspiring to be what you are. I'm happy in my skin, but both of us, black and white can have a happy livelihood. So no anger, but let's teach each other about the happy cultures that we pursue and enjoy. Thank you so much. Um, is there anything you wish you had done differently in your professional path? My, my favorite song is Frank Sinatra. I've always said to my family when I die, unfortunately I won't hear it, but play that one and say, I've, I've lived, I've loved, I've cried, but through it all, I can say it again. I did it my way. I am one of those that have had the opportunity of being well-organized, planning. And I think the spirit of learning has allowed me to say, it's not a mistake. It was a learning opportunity. So I've lived a life of no regrets. I, I am privileged. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you so much, um, Professor. Um, there is another question over here. Uh, how do you help mentor women who may be lacking in confidence about their abilities to lead? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to be too explicit about the example, but recently I had an opportunity to take a couple of girls, um, postgraduates, postdoctoral, to an international seminar which they were attending for the first time. So we sat during an international conference, three-day conference. I said to them, and I was their mentor, I was offered these fellowships. I said, why aren't you asking questions? They said, we are shy. I said, you know what? There is no stupid question. Just get up and talk about yourself. If you have no question, just say, I am Dr. X. I come from University Y. And I've just enjoyed being here. And my ambition is one, two, three. One of them did up, did exactly that, got up, said that, 
and she wrote me a few weeks ago, she's been taken up for a two year fellowship by one of the people in the audience. So I'm one of those that's always pushing to say, and engaging to say, I expected you to do this, why didn't you do it? I'm very thorough with and tough with the mentees and some of them have broken rank to say I'm too tough, but I never had it easy. So if you have no confidence and we agree, you have come to me for a confidence booster, don't, 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 don't handcuff me. Be honest and allow me to be honest with you. And you'll break out of it. No one, no one can do it without help if they know their handicap. So I think the best way to get out of it, one, is once you know you lack confidence, come to a mentor and say, can you help me be, build confidence? And allow the mentor to be honest with you. Don't take offense because they mean well for you. Thank you, thank you very much. Simit is trying hard to be a more inclusive. Uh, what is your recommendation for the community as a whole? You know, I've been talking a lot, reading a lot about inclusivity. And I think the starting point is building the pipeline. You, you can't just wake up and say you are inclusive. Two, it's understanding the culture of the organization. Three, it's about leadership. You have to have intentional leaders who embrace inclusivity. Then four, it's about a roadmap. It's about a frank discussion of what is the future that we want? What will we look like when we are inclusive? And then it's an honest mirror of what do we look like now? Do we, do we walk the talk or it's theory? And then once we know the now and the future we want, what are the baby steps towards that? And what are the game changers that will really fast track us into doing the right thing? It's just the right thing to do. So embrace it, study it, understand it, and inculcate it in your leadership so that they walk the talk. It can't be done by one person. It can't be done by the DG. It has to be done by all the leaders until it is done bottom up by all the followers. So it can be done. Thank you so much. Um, I see that we have two hands raised. Uh, so you, would you please open your micro and your camera? Thank you. Um, hello, Prof. Sabanda. It, it was, um, gosh, it's, it's been so humbling to listen to your presentation, and I will actually watch it again immediately afterwards. There's many of us from the Zimbabwe office. Um, I just wanted to ask, so being a catalyst of change, you must have experienced many roadblocks along your path. What would be the, the main advice you would give to not get dis disheartened? Thank you. <laughs> Many roadblocks for sure. It, it's all about the stereotypes. I mean, we are stereotyped as women, right? We're stereotyped as, has she got children? Um, you know, it's all the things, the box that you have to fit into as a woman. Or oh, how can she answer before the guys talk? Yeah, so all those are roadblocks, right? Because it comes back to you to haunt you that somebody said that about you. But I'll go back to the phrase I brought, don't be afraid to be a pioneer and don't be afraid to leave your, your, your purpose. Yeah, Don't turn back, but do it with humility and do it with respect because you can't be another person. But if your persona says I have a purpose and uh, forgot to share my new purpose is happiness, no one's gonna take that away from me, yeah? So <laughs> I say this, I get into my 60th year, it's project happiness, right? So when someone pushes me into unhappy space, that's a barrier, I back off and say, not for me, right? Not now, nope, I'm done with that. I'm done with that kind of people, right? And it's not easy as you're an up and coming person, but always take time to reflect on each day. You know, what could I have done different? What are my energizers? What are my stressors? 
what brings the best out of me? And you'll find with time, you're surrounded by the right network, you know, the right people who energize you, the right happy space where people say, how come she's always happy? They don't know you've worked for it. You've pruned out those stressors. And then you get to a stage where you say no to certain things and never be afraid for and all. But one thing I always say to, to young ladies, when you're called upon to lead, never say no, learn on the job. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, also, we have another hand raised. <clears throat> um, Binjao, Binjabi, would you please uh, open your mic and your camera? Thank you. Uh, thanks, Isabella. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Prof, for the inspiring words. I think one thing that I've taken from your um, presentation and your talk is pioneering with a purpose. And I think that's going to be my mantra going on. Uh, every morning, I'm going to tell myself, Whatever I'm doing today, let it have purpose and let it at least ignite a spark in someone's life. The problems I normally encounter with a lot of my um, colleagues and junior staff is that they don't take ownership of, of who they are, of the processes and procedures that affect them on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, people have their different characteristics. People have got a different way of thinking and doing. Uh, and I see a lot of people trying to conform to what is acceptable. And that in itself to me is something that's unacceptable because I find myself not conforming in so many ways than not. How do I advise my colleagues that it is okay to be different but in your differences, taking from you, lead with purpose, pioneer with purpose, have a conviction that at the end of the day, what you're doing, you stand by it, it's correct and it's right, and you're going to see it through. Because in many instances, you find people wanting to conform, clustering in groups and wanting not to stick out. What would be the best advice for them? Yeah, uh, Vimbaya, I don't sound, want to sound like a music gong, but go back to pioneering, yeah. pioneering progress with purpose, which you said you love and embrace. You know, don't yeah. be apologetic. You can't be a pioneer if you're apologetic, right? Mm. And you find it's uh, detractors who want you to always ask for permission to do. You can't be a pioneer. So I'm just unpacking the way pioneer. Dream, live your dream, have a plan, execute. And then that's when you'll find people say, wow, she's great. But when you have a dream, you want to consult Lindy, I'll say, please repeat, what exactly do you want to do? Are you sure you will do it? Are you sure, mm -hmm. did, have you asked so and so? But when you've done it, I will then come back and say, Bimbai, why don't you scale it up this way? Why don't you improve? But unless you pioneer, I won't know you. I won't know the leadership in you. I won't know your uniqueness. So mm -hmm. my advice to that is stand out, be bold. Don't be a show off, but lead with purpose. And when you do it with purpose, you have a conviction, you have a drive in you. People see you spending mm -hmm. long hours to cultivate your purpose. And when they see the fruits, they say, hey, that person had staying power. If it was me, I would have given up. And that's why for me, pioneering requires you to have that progress with purpose. Yeah? Uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. We have another question. Um, would you please, uh, Shadon, uh, would you please open um, your camera? Thank you. Ah, something is happening. We cannot hear you, even though it looks that, that your micro is open. Hey, Shadon. Oh, no. Okay. So maybe uh, you can write down the question in the chat and, when, and then we can read it for you. 
And um, meanwhile, I have two more questions um, uh, received in the Slido. Um, your recent, uh, sorry, uh, your recent blog talked about taking Masagro and take it to the farmer to Africa. Can you use this effort to generate more inclusion? Yep, so take it, take it to the farmer. So I first interfaced with Masagro in 2009. As Bram said, I was a board member at CIMIT 2009 to 2015. And your DG Bram was still a young man then. He was Mr. Masagro. And right from the onset, I saw that this is something that's a game changer. You're creating a platform for innovation. You are bringing in farmers, the government, private sector, and you're really making sure that farmers have options in terms of innovation, but that last mile of technologies at the farm level, at enterprise level is real. So that's the inclusion we're talking about. Through Masagro Africa, we are able to bring young people, which is one area of inclusion, which is always forgotten. I went to Zambia and face to face, I was able to see agripreneurs who are preparing the, the, the siling bags, the bags that are hematically syllable bags and selling those at village level. I saw agro dealers who were taking seeds to the farmer and farmers could be able to buy. I saw people who are opening up seed businesses, which were traditionally in my part of the world in Southern Africa, were for multinationals. So that's why I'm saying let's unpack inclusion. Let's look at where we are and where we have exclusion. It was in business of seed that was a big boy's business. It was in being in the village level, not selling Coca-Cola, but selling hematically syllable bags selling seeds to the farmers. It was in breeders. I saw a female breeder in Zambia running seed business, professionals crossing the line into business. I saw women, girls and men in ICT where they're using modern technology for speaking with farmers, sharing knowledge, disseminating, so let's unpack our value chain as farmers from farm to fork and say which ones were the traditional female dominated domains that was cooking at home. But when we move from farm to fork, we're looking at the input industry. Let's have young women, men, the full diversity. When we go to the kitchen, let's have our voice. My son the other day was saying he's newly married. He says, well, we last ate my mom's dish when she taught us how to cook. Because I said my job is to pay school fees and theirs is to clean the house and cook for the family because that's how I grew up. So when we talk of inclusion, diversity, let's look for the opportunities where we think in other terms and do things differently. And that's where we will leave no one behind. These highly segregated one person only, boys only job, girls only job, will not help us feed Africa, will not help us feed the world. Let's open up the whole value chain and infuse inclusion, no exclusion. And that's when we will all say, yes, we are all inclusive and not leaving anyone behind in any sector. Thank you, thank you. Um, we are. Um, we have still some questions. Um, do you still have a space to take on more mentees? Uh, I don't count the number of mentees because when when you come to me with a question, it means I and I agree to support or to help. Um, you become my mentee, and uh, if you enjoy the company and the straight talk, you keep coming. So I don't keep a directory, you don't register. You pick up my email address, it's public. Unfortunately, my phone is also public on, I'm active on WhatsApp and we dialogue, engage, compare notes. So yes, lots of space. That's my next phase. It's gonna be full-time soon of just giving back. I'm already doing it now, but if anything, I'm escalating that space of giving back because 
it is fulfilling and um yeah i've got the time for it thank you thank you so much professor sibanda for your great talk and stimulating presentation now i would like to invite brian Govart, director general of cmit um, to officially close the event and for further comments dr Govart, the floor is yours thank you and first and foremost lindy way Professor Sibanda, thank you for honoring us with your presence here today. And also thanking to you, to you, everybody online who had the courage to speak up, to ask the questions. I want to say to all of you, thanks for this gift, the gift of the story of your life. Thanks also to all of you to, to, to ask those questions and to be there for a pioneer in its own right. I'm sure that all as I did enjoy it and learned a lot from this exchange and leadership on leadership and life. Lindeve Professor Sivanda mentioned her values. Simit's new logo reflects systems and crop diversification. The colors are about soil, plant, and water, energy, food, and water nexus. But especially, the colors are also a reflection that we all are our, our own color. And that even if they don't mean anything separate, and they may not make sense immediately together, we are all important, and each leaf re uh, reflects a value. Integrity, teamwork, and excellence. And that's exactly what Lindewe also uh, transmitted to us, integrity, but also teamwork. Choose your mentors based on values, the questions they ask, the X factor you feel. Excellence, raise the bar. She challenged us to describe the organization we want to be as an inclusive organization, and then work towards that image of our better self. You as a CIMIT community have sent the signals loud and clearly that together we want to walk that walk towards that better organization that we have envisioned. If all of us are not afraid to pioneer with a purpose, if we do it with respect, we will achieve it. And above all, let us achieve our own and support each other to find and achieve that happy space. With this, I want to conclude this fourth women uh, 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 women Leaders uh, Seminar, this fourth, fourth seminar of Catalysts of Change. And join me together to look who's up next. Thank you very much. We are looking forward to a time when there is no more hunger, when there is enough food, the right food grown in the right areas, and the food can be available for everyone. It is affordable, it is available, it's nutritious, and it provides options for everyone. That requires a lot more than just the food itself. It requires sufficient water, sufficient natural resources, sufficient training and availability and knowledge for the farmers, especially smallholders and women for whom this is such a huge opportunity as well as a concern. They're the most impacted often by climate change. In a world where all of us are working together to address climate change and we've mitigated those severe risks, that is what we can all strive for. Please join our next seminar in the Catalyst of Change series on September 12th.